This is a tough program to do today. Really tough. We're going to discuss what is happening to our children. They're suffering from unexpected stress and anxiety. And to many of them, they're dying from the circumstances. On our program today, you'll hear from Brad Hunstable, who recently lost his 12-year-old son, Hayden, to suicide. You'll be joined by Brandy Vega, single mother of three and small business owner. Then my guest will be Charlie Peck, educational and mental health professional, discussing how we can help our children cope with stress and anxiety in these challenging times. And I want to thank you all for being here today. Today's program is brought to you by StreamYard. Put the power of live streaming video to work for your business, your brand, or for your cause. I'm using StreamYard to deliver our program today. Go to StreamYardCause.com and save $10. That's StreamYardCause.com and save $10. And if you've never used StreamYard be before, please just get your free account and you'll be so excited about how it works and how you're able to stream to Facebook, YouTube, LinkedIn Live. You'll be a fan. That's StreamYardCause.com. I'm just... Uh, kind of in a melancholy mood this morning, thinking about our subject and what we're talking about. Since the late 2000s, the mental health of teens and young adults in the U.S. has declined dramatically. That's the broad conclusion of a new study published in the Journal of Abnormal Psychology. Between 2009 and 2017, rates of depression among kids ages 14 to 17 increased by more than 60%. According to the study, the increases were nearly as steep among those 12 to 13, up 47 percent, and 18 to 21, up 46 percent. And rates roughly doubled among those ages 20 to 21. In 2017, the latest year for which federal data was available, more than one in eight Americans ages 12 to 25 experienced a major depressive episode, the study found. The same trends uh, held true when researchers analyzed the data on suicides, attempted suicides, and serious psychological distress. A term applied to people who score high on a test that measures feelings of sadness, nervousness, and hopelessness. Among young people, rates of suicidal thoughts, plans, and attempts all increased significantly and in some cases more than doubled between 2008 and 2017, the study found. These findings were based on data collected from more than 600,000 people by the National Survey on Drug Use and Health, an annual nationwide mental health survey conducted by a branch of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. I think it's a wake-up call, says Mary Helen Emeridino Yang, a professor of psychology and education at the University of Southern California, who is not affiliated with the new study. She said these findings are coming together with other kinds of evidence that shows we're not supporting our adolescents in developmentally appropriate ways. One of the study's authors also agrees there's an overwhelming amount of data from many different sources, and it all points in the same direction more mental health issues among American young people, says Jean Twenge, a professor of psychology at San Diego State University and author of iGen, a book about how technology affects the lives of young people today. So what's causing today's young people so much anguish? This is always a tough question to answer, as we can't prove for sure what the causes are, Twenge says, but there was one change that impacted the lives of young people more than older people. And that was the growth of smartphones and digital media, like social media, texting, and gaming. While older adults also use these technologies, their adoption among younger people was faster and more complete. And the impact on their social lives, much larger, Twinge says. Increased stress, Anxiety, depression, and suicide affects millions of families today. Brad Hunstable recently lost his son, 12-year-old Hayden, to suicide. You know, a week and a half ago, we had a wonderful day. 
Um, where me and Hayden were supposed to go get haircuts in my office. Um, both of us were getting shaggy as can be. And um, my water in my well went out. And, uh, you know, I needed help to fix it, so I called the smartest guy I know, which was my dad. Um, and I hadn't seen him because of the virus. I hadn't allowed him to go to work. I said, you got to work from home, man. I was worried about my dad just like everybody else. Uh, but he came over, helped me fix the well. It was a beautiful sunny day. We had a glorious time. Me, Hayden, and him fixing it. My dad even gave him a little mission that he had to watch something on the well. He was real proud of that. I remember Hayden coming up to me in the kitchen. I gave him the biggest hug, and I kissed him on the hair. I hugged him tight for some reason. I didn't know what would be the last time I'd hug him. My dad did the same, and we talked some more. And Hayden went upstairs to his room. Um, and uh, my dad had to go. Uh, I had to take a phone call. Um, April went to go um, pick up a friend. You know, the social isolation, we kind of reached a point where we felt like it was counterproductive. So we're gonna let her have a friend spend the night and they were gonna get some food. And my dad left, April left. I went into my room real quick. Just my little daughter, me and Hayden were at home. I took a call, it took about 25, 30 minutes. Walked outside and uh, my eight year old daughter came down the stairs and said, Hayden hung himself. And I ran upstairs. Tried. I want nobody ever feel this, to see what I saw and to feel this pain. I want nobody. And as we found out, you know, we were in shock the first couple days. Just, just how, where did this come from? How did this happen? I'm a horrible parent. I'm horrible. And uh, come to find out that he had. Broke his monitor again. Broke his monitor again. And in a just a rash of, of emotion and probably anger at himself and maybe scared to get in trouble and embarrassed and all these emotions. You know, I went in his closet and rudimentally did something that I, I know he regrets. The kicker of it was it was three days before his 13th birthday. And he was so excited about that birthday. Um, so excited about his birthday and he was going to get a controller, some new controller that was going to really make his game, Xbox game better or his, uh, Fortnite game better. And, um, and so when he broke his monitor, I believe he felt like he ruined his party. He ruined his birthday. He already couldn't have a birthday party because of social isolation. Imagine that as a 12 year old boy, you know, that's just, that's gotta be. Those are the things you look forward to as a kid, and then you then you and you accidentally ruin it because you break your monitor and you aren't gonna be able to use your birthday present here in a couple of days and you can't go see your friends, um, and you're you know you're stuck. You didn't have PE class to run it all out, and you know you know all those things. Everybody's playing for it not across the country. Kids are staying up later than they are, so they're and again they they have they don't have the skills. We as a society, me as a parent, us as parents haven't necessarily giving them all the tools to, to properly handle. And in that moment, um, probably not understanding the, the finality of the situation, went in the closet and got himself in a situation I believe he couldn't get out of. Um, and might have been, have been have been an accident. My eight-year-old daughter saw some of it. We don't know exactly what. We'll let the counselors, professionals help us in that. Um, but I know she, when she saw blood coming out of his nose, she came and got me. She did the right thing. I don't think she even knew what, what was happening. She knew blood. She came and got me, ran upstairs. I didn't have my cell phone on me. Um, and I told her, go get my cell phone downstairs. And she ran downstairs just like an amazing human being and got it for me. And I, and I happened to have an AED, an automatic electronic defibrillator in my house. And I said, go get that medical thing out of the pantry. She'd never seen it and didn't know what it was. And she brought that to me. Very proud of her. She was ready to, she was ready to execute. Um, and I said, hey, you go outside and go. I called 911 by this point. I said, go outside, keep the door open, and wait for the cops. Um, wave them down. And as I was given CPR, I 
was on the verge of collapsing. I um, literally was on the verge of collapsing. I was praying to God just to give me the strength. I never knew how hard that is. Um, and out of nowhere, and all my, my neighbors appear and help me take over and help me help us try to save him. Um, social isolation is hard enough for adults. It's even more hard for our kids. And um, I have been saying COVID killed my son. I believe it, but not how not how we think. I believe my son would be alive today if he was in school. And that's not to discount the massive suffering around the world around this virus. I thank you all for listening to me. This is, uh, I need to get this off my chest. I'm now one of Hayden's soldiers, who is a soldier of God. Um, and what's a horrible tragedy, um, I'll be damned. I'll be damned if, if I don't make this a little bit better. And politicians, for those of you who um, made the decisions you made, I know, I'm not, I know you're not perfect, but there's got to be accountability. Um, and not, not accountability like I'm doing in a bad way, accountability in what's, what's legally right, my, my rights as a citizen, which is to speak out, which is to influence change. And if I don't think you're a good enough leader, I can spend my pocketbook and my time and my effort to get you out of there. I don't want my son to his memory to be the last mistake he ever made. Nobody wants that. I don't. But I want his memory to be that smile. I want his memory to be his heart, his dedication, his tenacity. Um, and I want his memory to be that he made a big difference in the world. A little flame spark around the world. I love you all. Thank you all for your support. All my friends, all my family. Um, and buddy, see you soon. This guys. I watched that video a couple times now, and I can't imagine. That's why this is a very difficult program. As a suicide survivor, suicide attempt survivor myself, and growing up with suicide in terms of uh, my mother tried it many times when I was a child. It's just a, it's a tough discussion to have, but one that we need to have more often. And I know it's a taboo topic to discuss, and it's very near and dear to many of our hearts. And unless you've had the experience of someone in your family attempting suicide or committing suicide, you don't know what it's like. Someone uh, left a comment to this video last night that just said, oh, geez. I mean, here's one dad, you know, saying that the lockdown affected his son's life, you know, whatever. It was just one in a million. And I thought, to that parent, that one is everything. And so I hope that person can find uh, some heart to know that there's a lot of pain, a lot of anguish for parents during this time. And there's a lot of stress, anxiety, and depression. For children. And so I know this is a tough, to uh, very tough topic, and I'm grateful for my next guest. She is a mother of three and owner of Vega Media Studios in Salt Lake City, the premier video studio and production house in Utah. For more information, go to vegamediastudios.com. Welcome, Brandy Vega. Oh, thanks for having me. I that video really got me. It was it was hard to watch because you know some of my story and uh, I do know some of your story, and that's why when I knew I needed an opening segment, I felt like I was supposed to reach out to you. And I know it's tough to come on on the heels of that story because it will hit so close to home. But tell us about your three kids and how these times are affecting them. Mm -hmm. your relationship with them? I have three, three kids. Um, I have an 18 year old daughter who was a senior and just graduated. I have a 13 year old daughter who's in junior high and I have a three year old son I adopted from foster care. Part of the reason this video got me emotional is because I almost lost my 13 year old 12 at the time to suicide last year. And we spent 10 days in the hospital 
She was five minutes from death. It was the scariest moment of my entire life. It was the hardest week of my entire life. And my older daughter struggled too. And so going through that, um, I as a teenager attempted suicide at 12. And I've actually taught suicide prevention. So to, to hear this story about Hayden just really breaks my heart. One of my dear friends lost his 16-year-old son by hanging um, over the summer as well. And for those parents, my heart goes out to you. I feel so blessed every day that I have a second chance. But dealing with all of this and hearing his story, we had a conversation yesterday with some of my friends talking about there's no right answer when it comes to COVID because somebody's going to be upset no matter which way we go with it. But the the uh, the double-edged sword are the suicides, are the domestic violence. In Utah yesterday, a father shot his two young sons and then shot himself. Domestic violence, depression, anxiety, who knows what one thing leads to another. I know for my daughter, she's been devastated. She's a senior. She's worked her whole life. I remember from the time she was born, we were so excited. And I said, you get to graduate in 2020. Perfect vision, 2020. In January, February, we thought everything's great. This is going to be a fantastic year. And then just like a ton of bricks, we were all hit. The whole world was hit with coronavirus, with COVID-19. And she struggled. There's been so many tears. Mom, I've worked so hard my whole entire life. And now this and is it going to go back to normal? Where's life going to be? And she's on medication already for anxiety and depression. And so this has been a super challenge for all of us. Even my 13-year-old who um, struggled last year. So as a parent, my three-year-old, of course, he doesn't know any better. And for him, he's been happy because we've been around more. He's had his siblings there. He's had his mom there. Um, but for my older kids, there's so much uncertainty at this time, even for myself. I mean, I'm talking about projects that I've had in the work through my business where, you know, these are things I've done for 16 years straight, concerts that I've worked in and helped um, do camera on or production on, events that we've done and, and things are just canceled and we're talking about school and we don't know if things are going to go back to normal. And it is the, the one thing that his dad said um, that really got me emotional was when he said, Hayden, his son made this decision and he probably regretted it. And when my daughter came out of her um, coma, I said, are you glad you're awake? Are you glad that you woke up and that you didn't die? And she said, yeah, I am. I knew it was a mistake, but then I thought it was too late. She says, I'm really happy to be alive. And I think that that's the case with most people, and especially these kids who don't have the right coping skills. They just make a rash decision, not understanding the magnitude of that decision and the long-term outcome and effects. And so it just is completely devastating and it's heartbreaking. And I know for me, um, when I attempted at 12 and had taken pills and cut my wrist and, and heard a voice saying, Your, my mom couldn't handle it, Thankfully, I stopped because I look at my life and how great it's been. And I look at my beautiful kids and my business and the experiences and the opportunity to serve my country and just everything I've done. And I feel so blessed that that wasn't taken from me. So, yeah, cause this has been extremely um, devastating all the way around. I mean, kids are they're depressed. They're losing their minds and they don't know how to cope. I want to understand more from your perspective because my children are older now, almost 22 and 26. How has the lockdown, the quarantine really affected your relationship with them? In some ways, I'll tell you that this has been one of the best times and honestly, one of the worst times, one of the best times because we've been forced to be together. We've been forced to have hard conversations. We've been forced to uh, quarantine in the same small space for weeks. And you know, the first few weeks, I was very adamant, like, hey, we're here, we're not going anywhere, no friends, like, let's, let's be here and, and do this. And, and it was hard. It was, it was very hard. You know, the kids wanted to go and I was the big bad guy. And, um, you know, after three or four weeks, I was like, 
they're losing their minds and I'm losing my mind. And so we started introducing a friend or two, kind of like Hayden's dad said too, because you have to cause and effect, right? Like, yes, we have COVID. We know it's a serious issue. We know that some people are dying from it. At the same time, we have mental health over here. And you've already got levels of anxiety and depression, financial stress for older adults. But for the kids, I think it's just all the uncertainty. They, they don't know how to cope with it. They don't know how to channel that energy. And when they're cooped up at home, it's hard. It's hard to comfort your kids. And, and it's hard even as a parent because I don't necessarily know what's happening either. I mean, some days I need comforted. Because I'm watching riots and my business is, you know, all my events are canceling and I'm thinking about school and I'm thinking about the future of my children and what is next, the future of our country. It's a lot to process as a grown adult who's got 42 years of um, life experience. So you put that on an 18 year old, they just, it, it's hard. They don't know how to cope. And I think as a parent, it's our jobs right now, always our jobs, but to look for the signs. The hard thing for me was with my 13 year old, a lot of the signs of suicide are some of the signs of puberty and teen years, you know, like pulling away from your parents, um, being isolated, being moody. Those are a lot of things that happen with kids when they're transitioning into adulthood, the 12 to 13. So I noticed some of these things. I I noticed her, her pulling away. Um, my 18 year old, on the other hand, I didn't notice that she was having some destructive behaviors. Like I would encourage parents to have candid conversations with their children. How are you coping with this? How are you feeling inside? How are you dealing with your anger, or your frustration? Are they cutting themselves? Look, look on their body because that's something that they can hide easily. And it's something that they're ashamed to talk about, but lots of kids cut themselves in here in here on your inner thighs. And, um, you know, people also talk about getting help. Oh, there's help available all the time. Oh, there's the apps. Oh, there's this and that. Well, guess what? When I decided to get help and and I couldn't get my daughter to stop crying for three days and I couldn't get her um, functioning, I, I ended up calling Instacare. No, we don't see patients for this. I ended up calling primary doctor. No, we don't see patients for this. Mental health. They said, yeah, come down, go to mental health. Oh no, she's a minor. We can't see her. We need to take her to this other place. Take her to the other place. The other place tells me no. Five places in a day to get help for a child who I'm not sure is going to survive the day. Finally end up in the ER. The ER doctor comes in, acts like you're crazy and says, We don't deal with this. You have to deal with behavioral health. And by the way, they're out till next week. I said, well, I'm here today. So the hard part is they talk about there being help, but I feel like some of the resources are not there. I am thankful for uni at um, the University of Utah, but they only take kids if they've actually had a suicide attempt. So if they're just suicidal, it's rough. And, And the hard thing is this. I knew what to look for. I know my kids. I would have never in a million years thought that my child would do that ever, ever. And the fact that I was five minutes from losing her haunts me every day. And I mean, that little boy, he had just had a good moment with his dad and and his grandfather and there weren't really signs. Uh, We have to be more vigilant than ever, than ever because of the current status of our country, the current status of the situation, kids don't know what to do. We don't know what's going to happen. And so it's just, it's making them more um, nervous and anxious and depressed and, and they don't know how to cope. And also social media. I mean, I love social media. You guys know that I'm on here. I do my business through there. I communicate with my friends and my family through social media. Kids don't necessarily know how to navigate it. There was a girl overseas she was 16. She had a a decent Instagram following and she had said on there, I'm feeling suicidal. Should I kill myself? This was her question to her group of friends and followers. Should I kill myself? Yes or no. 
69% of her so-called friends told her to kill herself. And you know what? She did. It breaks my heart because we're so callous. We don't understand the magnitude of our words and the magnitude of our decisions. And these kids just cannot comprehend the finality of the choices that they're making. And it's, it's completely devastating. So when we do talk about COVID deaths and things, yeah, there's a lot of them. I mean, who knows? Fathers not being able to provide, mothers not being able to provide, um, all the domestic abuse, all the depression, not knowing, it really is devastating. But I think as, as parents right now, and for me, my daughter, she's leaving this month to go to Texas for college. And this is something we've been planning for years. And it's just like, we didn't have a real graduation. Our vacation, we had a graduation trip planned. We were supposed to be on a cruise next week, is canceled. We don't know where we can go. We don't know what we can do. So it's kind of like all these milestones that you set that you're excited for and these opportunities and these next big things, they're just falling away and we don't know how to fix it. I don't know how to make it better. And she's saying, I may never even get back to college. Like, even if I go there, am I even going to be able to go to school? Is it all going to be online? And, and I think that that's scary to do. So hug your kids. And it's not just kids, it's adults, it's loved ones. Like we used to say in the military, check your foxhole, check everyone else's foxhole. Now is the time to reach out and say, how are you really doing? And that's one of the things I love about you cause is because you check on people and you just let them know you care and that they're loved. And sometimes you're the only one doing that. Well, thank you. And you know, I have to be candid with you. Sometimes I, I made this comment recently. Uh, sometimes the path to your life's mission is a, uh, very lonely path and you wonder if you're making a difference you and i have had that discussion and i got a yeah a facebook message from somebody in the uh far wilderness of alaska oh wow i love alaska this, this last weekend and sometimes you just wonder are you making a difference right yeah you and I have these experiences all the time, whether it's helping someone at a gas station, taking the homeless to dinner, those things that we just don't talk about because that I believe sometimes or many times takes away from the strength of what you're trying to do for the world. If you're doing it for public praise or the plaudits of men, when you just do it quietly and you come home and, and you're all alone and you just, you just ask yourself, geez, am I making a difference? And then this person sent me the coolest message out of the blue uh, that just said, you are a lighthouse. And sometimes just think of yourself as the lighthouse keeper. No one will ever climb the lighthouse to tell you thank you. All those ships are just going to go by and you're going to make a difference. And you're going to do it all alone. And so I would say that to our viewers and listeners today that you just never know the impact and as small as it may be to make those posts, to make those phone calls, to send those texts, even if they go unresponded to the message was sent and more than ever before we do need each other, but we're not sure how to communicate with each other. We don't know what to say. Right. And especially during a time of suicide, stress, and depression, what do you say? Just like that person that left that comment yesterday was actually pretty heartless and belligerent about the father who had to deal with his son committing suicide. Now you've shared your story of what happened in your family. You sometimes don't know what to say. No. And, you know, it, it's not something that I want to talk about we don't want to talk about the hardest times of our lives. We don't want to talk about our failures. We don't want to talk about our fears and what we cannot control. My kids don't want anyone to know any of this. They're great, fantastic kids. People love them. They're great. But all of us have internal struggles and demons. We all do. There's stuff that we deal with that nobody knows about. 
And I think it's about time that we say it's okay to have some of these discussions. It's okay to say I was suicidal, but that does not make me weak. I am still here. So far, you, me, and anyone watching, we've all survived 100% of the lousy, horrible, dreadful days we never thought we would get through. And this is what I tell my kids when something hard comes up. Listen, do you remember that really hard thing we went through? You made it through that. We can get through this. And there's also, I was pretty discouraged this past week when I went downtown and I saw all of the graffiti and all of the negative comments and all the things for, it, it was just so disheartening and discouraging and it hurt my soul. And I remember a quote from a news director. I used to do TV and I was a reporter and an anchor. And I remember a quote from one of my news directors because people are mean and hateful. They'd be like, wow, Brandy's getting fat. Wow, Brandy's stupid. She's ugly. She's ignorant. I can't, I mean, I would get these comments sometimes and it would be like, you don't even know me. You don't know me and you say this to me like it hurt and you try to have a thick skin. And I remember one of my news directors and he said to me, Brandy, for every one negative comment, there are 10,000 people out there that love you. And I've had to remember that this is when I was 20 years old. I was the youngest reporter Fox had ever had. And I, over the last 20 plus years, I've, I've had to tell myself that as I see this. For every one negative bad person out there, there's 10,000 good people. For every one bad day, there's going to be 10,000 good days. Like we have to continue to be positive. We have to have open dialogue with our kids. These conversations are hard. They're uncomfortable. And I sit there sometimes and I reached over just driving with my daughter. I forced myself to say, how are you doing right now? Are you scared? Is there anything you want to talk to me about? Have you felt depressed? And, and the doctors told me this, and I think it's good advice for anyone, especially if you have the kids, ask them on a scale of one to 10, how are you feeling emotionally? On a scale of one to 10, where are you with suicide? You might be really shocked at the answer. And I'm gonna just implore anyone who's watching who is a parent or you have a loved one, be frank. Be blunt, ask these questions. People want to know on a scale of one to 10, one being I'm not suicidal at all and 10 being I'm ready to end it. Where are you? And they'll probably give you the truth. And once you get that truth, you need to take action. And that might be you don't let them out of your sight. That might be you get medication. I had a family member who was like, don't get your kid on medication. Don't put them on this medication. Antidepressant, you know, this, this, this. When people asked me last year, how, how are you doing? How are your kids? My answer was, I'm just trying to keep them alive. And they would laugh. And I would say, it's not a joke. My goal this year is to keep my children alive, whatever that takes, however that looks. And it's not a reflection of us as a parent. That's the hard thing because when my... When my beautiful 12 year old tried to end her life, I was at work and I felt like the biggest failure as a parent. I thought my daughter thinks her life is so bad and I'm so horrible that she doesn't even want to be here. And that was the hardest thing for me. It was really hard to feel like you failed. And I did a lot of soul searching, a lot of praying, and people's emotional states, their ideas of suicide and what they're going through is, is not a reflection of you. It is not a reflection of you and whether or not you failed or what you could have done. It's them. It's a chemical balance. It's issues that they are struggling with. It's internal demons. They love you and you're not a failure and it is not your fault. Now, what you can take away from that is to ask them on a scale of one to 10, to get them medication, to get them counseling, to let them know that you're there, to let them know that nothing they can ever do, nothing they can break, nothing they can destroy, no life choices, no sexual choices, no religious choices, none of that can change your love for them and that no subject is off the table. I tell my kids, you can tell me any single thing 
I will always take a hard truth over an easy lie. You can come to me with anything and I will love you no matter what. We'll work through it. And I think it's important that not just kids, but that anyone knows that, that you love. Anything you want to talk about, talk to me. Even if you think it's going to kill me, let's talk about it. Because there's nothing in this life worth losing you over. And so I just, I'm thankful that I'm able to have these hard conversations now. I, it doesn't mean that I might not go through hardship. It doesn't mean I understand it all. And that I don't sometimes still have hard days. But hopefully, by me sharing our experience, we can help other kids other parents and you know maybe maybe somebody can be saved maybe one life right that's our mission one life every day we're trying to make a difference and ultimately our own children's lives are those ones those twos those threes in your case two in my case those are the lives we're thinking about every day and as they get older you worry about them differently Right. My my children at 26 and 22 are two of the most independent adults I have ever, ever met. So right. many times I have to reach out to them to, to, you know, to appear on the radar because they have uh, they've been on their own. They've been self-sufficient. They've been. Just independent souls. So enjoy the ride wherever you are, parents watching and know that you can communicate and talk about it. And Brandy, thank you so much for sharing so much today. You're welcome. My, heart. my pleasure. Again, if, if one thing, and I would also encourage anybody who's watching, if you're struggling, if you have questions, find me on social media, Brandy Vega, send me a private message. I'm happy to talk to you. I'm happy to share the story. We were set up to maybe go talk to some schools before all this happened. Um, I, I feel like sometimes God gives us these challenges and he gives us these experiences so that perhaps not only once we survive them, maybe we can help others along our path. And so I just, I so appreciate you and what you're doing and to bring education and awareness. Also, if I can real quick before I go, um, promote goodeedrevolution.org, my nonprofit. It's on social media. Please find us because in the dark times like this, there is nothing more rewarding than helping others in need. And we've got a big push coming up on Good Deed Revolution and where we're going to try to make the world a better place. And I believe in that mission. I believe in that cause very much. Again, that's gooddeedrevolution.org, gooddeedrevolution.org. And as you know, when I created the Be Happy Masks, I thought, how can we benefit others? And so proceeds from... Each of the sale of, of a Be Happy Mask does go to Good Deed Revolution. Brandy Vega, again, God bless you, sister. I love you. I love you, too. You're Thanks wonderful. Your time. Stay okay. the course. Thank you, guys. Enjoy the rest of the broadcast, and thank you for the awareness. Wow. That's powerful. Sometimes you just don't know what to say. It gets so, so real. My next guest is an education and mental health professional. She's the mother of three boys and the host of the Advancing Humanity podcast. And the goal of her podcast is to highlight valuable contributions people are making towards a thriving human experience. You can subscribe to her podcast today by going to advancinghumanitypodcast.com. That's advancinghumanitypodcast.com. My guest is Charlie Peck. Charlie, we are connected. <laughs> we got you. it. We did you know, it. I was telling Brandy, you know, she she came on uh, to help uh, give us a, an opening segment there. And I mean, you, you understand uh, when it's live TV yeah. like that, you're not going to cut off that conversation. You can't. And that's why I, <laughs> I said, people don't know, but I sent you a message saying, Branding's doing, Brandy's doing great. You keep her on. She's yeah. doing fantastic. Charlie, there's so much I want to talk about because right. there's so much happening in the world. But from your perspective as an educator and, and mental health professional, let's get to know you a little bit better. This is my first experience with you. So mother of three, how old are your boys? Yes, seven, nine, and 16. Yes. 
Seven, hey nine, and 16. You are knee deep in the kimchi. <laughs> yeah, that is a good way to put it. Yes, I am. And how are all of the current events affecting your kids? Tell us a little bit about your home life with all that's going on. Yeah. So it's so interesting how everybody's affected differently. My younger kids, um, they need me to homeschool them and I need to show up to my high school students online. So that's been tricky. My 16 year old is actually, he went to go stay with his dad. Um, so that actually has been helpful to him because it's not, it's just, we're in each other's space all the time. So that's been a little escape for him. And we've done creative things to get together. So we'll go for drives and and just talk. So it's really interesting how it's affected our family. It's helped us because the time we're spending together is very quality. And even the younger ones, they didn't like my kid, all of them, they didn't have me around for a while. I was so busy, so busy. A lot of us understand that. So they get to have more of me. So it's been beneficial for us that way. I think parents can understand some of that. How do you explain the isolation to them? How how do you describe that there's this invisible virus that might kill us, right? And not have that totally distort their thinking that, okay, what does that really mean? Because Netflix has contagion. So a child <laughs> only needs to watch one movie like that or Outbreak, the good old days with Dustin Hoffman and think, if I go outside, I'm going to die. Yeah. That's, how do children not make movies in their head? Well, they do. That's why we adults need to step in and and be honest with them about what's really happening. And so I don't lie to my kids. I'm always honest with them, but age appropriately. And they know that they just need to wash their hands and they need to stay away from each other. And they understand why, because I've told them. And I don't say it in such a way that I'm saying, oh, it's going to kill you. Watch out. Like, because fear is very powerful, too. And we don't want to do that to our kids. But we do need to show caution and we need to teach them because they're going to grow up with this. I, I don't see this going away anytime soon. They're going to grow up with this. It's affecting their life. And some of the older kids understand what life was like pre-COVID and during, and now they're going to experience life afterwards. So we have to have that conversation with them to help them shift through that in a healthy way. It's really important we talk to them. And I think we're going to have a new uh, date system, right? We used to be BCAD, and now it's uh, PV or PC, (laughs) pre-COVID and post-COVID, or I, I don't know, because to your point, there will not be a return to the old normal. Nope. There's no way. And for someone like me, who's looking forward to change in this world that we need, and you can tell by a lot of demonstrations in the United States, uh, that's just one way that needs to shift. We have a lot of things that need to shift. Our education system needs to shift. Our mental health system is doing a great job. We need to insert that more into other systems. Family systems, we really need to work on family systems. Um, do you think that's where it all really starts, though? It sure and, does. And that- that bold here. I'm going to go full screen for you so sure. you can talk about this but because you've got your family rules behind you. I remember growing up as a child, I grew up in somebody else's house because my family, we definitely put the fun in dysfunctional. So I grew up, <laughs> two doors up at the Haas family and they had their family rules and I adopted their family rules as my rules because I wanted to be a member of the Haas family. Tell us about your family rules. Yeah. Okay. So I'm a parent and a human being and I screw up all the time. So let's be very clear that this isn't the image that always happens in our house. I'm not going to lie about that either. Uh, It's everybody has a little dysfunction. I guess we've talked about it's how we respond. So the, I love the very first line there. It's always about being kind. I mean, if we can be kind, a lot more in this world will change. And showing empathy towards others and connecting to others. I mean, Brandy mentioned so many of these important factors. I I think people need to know that they're seen. People need to understand that they are valued. And yes, we need to reiterate those with people we love because they don't always feel that way. Even though we, like, she really touched my heart when she talked about her children because I know what that's like. Parents know what that's like. If anything goes wrong with those kids, you feel tremendous guilt. 
and and it's painful. It's so painful. And I can understand some of the pain she experienced that that some of that stuff happened in, in my own life with my own kids. So what we need to do is make sure they're seen. And what I'm looking forward to for the rest of society is the ones who are marginalized. We need to make sure they're seen. And that is a responsibility we have. And that's why these systems need to shift. That's what's so important. How can we help them be seen? Education oh. is huge. Education's huge. Sometimes we don't know this. So sometimes we think that the people that we're looking at in front of us have a, a presentation of being okay. But unless we look them in the eyes or unless we learn to look for certain shifts in their presentation or their attitudes or their behaviors, we're not really going to pick up on that. So I think it's important that we have education. And where do we get that? Well, the school systems, we start young, start young and we educate. And I, I was talking about this. I always talk about this. It's a triangulation approach. We need to educate kids what's going on in your brains and your bodies. And how do we help you self-regulate? How do we help you understand your own needs and communicate those needs? And then we need to educate parents. So understanding the different developmental needs is important and how to tune in with your kids, how important eye contact is when you're speaking. I mean, we're in a society today, we know that people's faces are in their phones. That's That will change eventually because we'll have different technology. But right now that's what we're facing. So it's really simple if you just tell, and a lot of parents do this anyway, this is nothing major. They know this, have your kid look, the, look you in the eyes when they're talking with you and when you're talking with them something so simple like it's it's a way of showing intimacy and value of the other person and you have, you also have to share that information with your kid so we have to educate kids we have to educate parents give them the tools they need in the home early on and throughout the developmental stages i mean one of the things i did in in my schools i always pressure or even our school board any school board T uh, teach teens about their own brain, teach teenagers how their brain operates and why they take risk, uh, risk more than others. Teach their parents why their brain operates the way they are and why uh, teenagers behave the way they do and talk the way they, they do. You need to communicate with them differently than you do your five and six and seven year old. And then of course, you need to educate educators and staff of schools because we're the ones that spend so much time with them away from families. We are the second major agent of socialization. We need to know what to look for. Trauma is huge. Trauma informed schools are, are learning how kids are showing up in the classroom. And that way, if we understand that those behaviors are not something that needs to be punished, we need to address them differently. We will have a shift. We need to do that in the future. We have a great opportunity to do that stuff now. You bring up an important point, though. If you're the second most important factor in their social development, as we've taken children out of yeah. school, though, yes, many of these children are slipping through the cracks. I just yes. saw an article about a six-year-old that was chained in the garage for months because had that child been going to school every day, they probably wouldn't have slipped through the cracks. Right? They There's a lot of children slipping through the cracks, whether it's charter yes. school, public school, whatever. Talk about that for a second, because I, I'm also seeing that many of these schools don't see themselves coming back first thing right after the summer. I know. I, I know it's a struggle. And I, I think we need to find a way to get back um, so we can be involved because that's where teachers report. And if they're not seeing the kids, they're not seeing something to report. There's nothing tangible. Um, and that's why we have to go back and educate families. We have to. We have to educate people who are thinking about getting married. We are ed have to go back and educate or, or partnering up, right? Um, forming a family. So that doesn't mean they have to be married. But if if you're, you're even thinking about forming a relationship with someone who you might have children with, that's important because that's the future of our society, of our, our humanity. And so we have to think about people who are pregnant and teach them about what they're doing now and what kind of stress they enter they have in their lives, how that might affect the developing brain of their child. It starts there. It starts before there. It starts with uh, getting proper nutrients before you even conceive. So we really have to start by educating properly. We have so much information from neuroscience, from uh, advancements in, in disease. We have advancements in medical uh, medications. We need to advance in our education of our bodies and our brains and our emotions and how they all tie in together. 
And so when we can educate early on, we can make shifts in society. So being away from school is detrimental. I mean, we've got to find a way to get back. We have to. I don't know how that's going to look. Um, I, I'm not the expert of that, uh, you know, I'm, but we've got to find a way to get back. We have to have connection. And the, the gosh, it is so sad about Hayden um, in your first piece there and the father. And, and he's right. He's right to talk about this. He's right to speak out publicly because we don't always know who's suffering. And so getting back to the school system allows children not to feel isolated. The people in society who are quote unquote deviant, it's because they've experienced rejection and isolation. And those two things are really detrimental to the human spirit. We, we have to feel connected. We have to feel valued. So we can't isolate. We've got to find new creative ways to keep people safe, but get back together. Yeah, this is the craziest, and I'm going to use that word liberally, the craziest social experiment yeah. that we yeah. possibly could be doing right now. I say that all the time because I mean, it's a great I, social experiment, unfortunately. I mean, what what a perfect storm. So, I mean, it's 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 sad, so sad what happened to George Floyd. And, and we can talk in a minute about how children view violence and police and authority figures and things. But what happened to him is an absolute tragedy. It was police brutality. It was unacceptable. I hope they and they will receive justice in the full letter of the law. OK, that being what it is. I don't believe that had people not been locked up for months yeah. with no hope and had 39 million people unemployed and being told that if you go outside or if you try to open your business, you're going to be arrested. This was talk about the perfect storm because you can go back and read what happened in 1968 in America. Yeah. And full disclosure here, you're in Canada. You're up in Ontario? I am, yes. Okay. I'm American. I'm from Kentucky, but I'm, I live in oh. the Niagara region. Yeah. Oh, Niagara. Well, I'm, I'm yeah. very sorry to hear that. <laughs> Maybe that's why I reached out, so I'd have a, fan, a friend near Niagara Falls. <laughs> but if you look at what happened in 1968, almost, I mean, right to uh, Apollo 7 going into space is a prelude to the moonshot in 1969. What's happening right now with a pandemic with social justice, with racial divide, with a, a president seeking re-election, you look into it and it is, it is amazing the parallel with yes. what happened in 1968, except we did not have a countrywide shutdown at any time during 1968. That's yes. unprecedented. And I think we are going to see the effects of the lockdown. And I understand the politicians needed to do what they did because they didn't know the effects of COVID-19. So sure. they swung the pendulum that way, but there's a reason we go to prison to be punished. And the worst punishment of all is solitary confinement. Yes. Let's talk a little bit more about the human brain and what we've been experiencing during these tumultuous times. What else should we know about ourselves in dealing with all that's going on during this perfect storm? Well, we do know that fear leads us to do desperate things. I mean, we become very desperate when we're uncertain. And, and that's what happens in domestic violence, by the way. A lot of people don't they feel loss of control, so they seek to control others. Um, or you have fear of loss or fear of something out of your control. And so what's happening and being in isolation, we talk about this all the time too amongst ourselves here is, yeah, this perfect storm is, there's got to be a good outcome. We've got to use this time because people have time to think about the injustices. People felt it. People are feeling it now. People are losing others or people are um, reporting all of these things that are happening within their own life. They're not getting, they're not, they're losing their businesses. And then on top of that, these businesses now that they're trying so hard to keep afloat are now getting looted. I mean, there's so many things and, and we talk about nationally, but look at this global pandemic that's put everybody in a complete disarray. I mean, it is so unprecedented. We don't really know. We don't have all the data to make decisions around it. We really don't. I mean, even going back to school in September, for us, it's September in the States, some parts of the States, it's August. 
we don't have the information now to make those decisions. And I don't know that we will. So what I do know about the teen brain, or sorry, the teen brain, but the human brain, and I'm not a neuroscientist, I'm not an expert in that. But what I do know in my research is that there is a strong connection with our, our minds, our hearts, our bodies. And if you look up heart math, for example, we know that you can feel the energy from someone. If you just extend your arms, that's about how much that heart energy extends to other people. So you imagine that mob mentality, the rioting, they're so, they're, everybody's feeding off of each other. They're, they're so energized. And, and that's why those things occur. And, and people are in pain. It, it's, people are in pain. They're, they're, they're not sure. They're fearful. They're uncertain. So everybody's experiencing it different, but then we come together and connect with those who we have some common ground with. And that explains some of the behaviors that are showing up in the riots. I mean, there's a lot of oppression that has happened and it is showing up. We need to do something about it. How do we help our children understand it? We need our to just be are honest. Seeing unprecedented stress, anxiety, depression. And like I was talking about with Brandy, many families don't want to talk about it. I had a coworker for years who still to this day says being that vulnerable is weak. And there's no way on God's green earth he would ever share anything vulnerable by him. But I'm, I'm, I believe, and maybe this is what makes me unique in my mission to try to make the world a better place, to be a lighthouse in a storm, to share a message of light and truth and goodness and love, mm -hmm. is that most people can't share from the heart like that. They just don't know how yet. So what can we do as parents to communicate better so our children are not so afraid? So what kids need is reassurance. And they, they don't need any kind of condescending remark. They are very insightful. They're very impressionable. And we need to be honest with them age appropriately. And so you know your own kid. Um, but what I, I always strain first, if you're going to deal with your child, you have to deal with yourself first. Because they pick up on everything. So think about when a kid rides a bike and they fall off the bike. Well, the helicopter parent runs over and shelters them and um, says, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, move, move the bike. We're off. We're done. No, that's not the kind of parenting we need to move forward with in society. It's not helpful. So we need to be honest, but we also need to let kids understand that they need to be resilient and learn through this, but with our safe guidance. I mean, that's the key. And listen, there's lots of things I've done wrong as a parent, lots. And so I continue to do wrong things as a parent. But what I can say is that as long as kids know that they're valued, loved, and are secure, they're going to be okay. And so we're the front line there. So if you have a parent who doesn't feel that themselves, they're not going to be able to honestly share that with their kid and guide them through it. So I say, listen, if you're struggling, get help. There's lots of help out there. There's tons of remote opportunities here. I just finished clinical hours with a local organization that had to move towards virtual care, mental health care. And so I did this whole literature review to support how important that is, that we need to make that shift in society. And one of the podcasts I did is I talked to Zaina Kayette, and she talked about the future of uh, health in general, which also, of course, is mental health but physical health, and we're moving to a digitized healthcare system. So I say to parents, reach out, get all the support you can. You have it right from your home. You control the temperature. You control what you wear. Doesn't matter what you wear anymore. You don't have to pack up your kids to go anywhere. You don't have to find babies. Stay in your house, go to a quiet space, and talk to somebody who can help you through this so that you can show up to your kids better. That is really important, but we need to be honest with our kids and walk them through them and tell them, look, that's uncertain, but what is certain is you're loved and cared for here. That's why routines are great, but I always caution parents with figuring out strict routines with their kids because it's hard. It's straining on the family. Um, I say have loose routines right now so and have incentives for your kids. So yeah, you can play your video games, but you have to do this, this, and this first, right? You have to get dressed, brush your teeth, um, and do some homework if you still have that. And then you can have 30 minutes of video game time. Then you get outside, have it loose. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. Yeah, I think it's still important to have structure. 
I, yeah. I know a lot of parents who went loosey goosey when all this happened and said, well, it's just, yeah, it's an early summer vacation. And there were no limits, no rules. We don't know what the exit of this process looks like, right? If somebody told me, cause you can't eat sugar for a month. Okay. I think I would die, <laughs> yeah. right? Self-imposed. I would just, ah! <laughs> okay, but I could probably suck it up and do it. But right. if someone said to me, cause you may never eat sugar again. I don't know when you'll be able to have sugar again. That's mm -hmm. different. Yeah. Right. So if, if kids don't see an end to all this and it's just playtime, but on the other hand, the fear of this, we, we still have to have structures, right? I believe yeah. parents demonstrate love by having boundaries for their children. Yes. Because I grew up with, with kids who had no boundaries and they actually said, God, I kind of wish my parents had rules, family rules, and, and demonstrated that they love me, but they just let me do whatever. So these are interesting times. But I, I want to just reiterate what you said in that we cannot give away what we don't first possess. And so it is very difficult to give confidence, love to our children if we lack it. So what I'm hearing you say is really a first step forward to helping our children in challenging time is for us to get our crap together because That's they're going to notice all the little emotions. They're going to notice how we're reacting and we're responding. And I'm not saying be a good actor, but get your stuff together so that you have more to give to your children at this time. I, I said something on uh, social media that again, I, it's, it's interesting. You try to share love and happiness and goodness and, and it still causes a debate and, and people <laughs> reach out and uh, are so quick to tell you how stupid you are. But <laughs> I, I just believe that we just really need to take this opportunity to, to better ourselves, right? Somebody said, well, uh, what do you mean we should take this time to read and study and grow and develop? right? We're doing just the best we can with what's going on. And I thought, look, if you're now unemployed, then you have a new challenge not to take the next six months off because your children are going to suffer from poverty. What can you do to improve yourself during all of this? So when we do come out of this, you're a more valuable person. So enough said with that, but it does start with us as parents to become the best version of us. Then we have something to give to our children. Absolutely. So let me pivot just a little bit because it, it would be one thing to talk about the fear, being in isolation, and ooh, that invisible enemy that we call COVID. But now we add to that the civil unrest. And again, I don't want to get into the politics of who's calling the shots and what they are or are not doing right. Sure. It's, just, it's just tough. But I saw this article yesterday in The Blaze, and the headline says, Antifa kid who smashed a police car and incited riots in Pittsburgh is escorted into uh, custody by his mom and dad. So video is really cool on social media, right? Because you can take your phone to these younger folks watching and say, oh, look, Instagram. <laughs> look, look at me. I'm standing next to this burning police car. Well, you know, that is evidence. So moms and dads, what can we do to help? be in touch with our children so we're not blindsided by these parents who said we had no idea our son was involved in these kinds of things yeah well and i haven't read the whole thing so i don't know all the circumstances but it sounds like the idea here is how do we make sure that our kids are staying out of trouble because <laughs> we think that they're yes doing good things and they're not always doing good things i think we have to understand where the kids are coming from um the stage of life is big and again if we understand the team brain, they don't see, they see the long-term consequences of their action. The whole prefrontal cortex is not developed all the way. They don't really understand it the way we adults do, but to them, it's, there's evidence out there that shows it's that they kind of do know, they could kind of guess what might happen, but the benefits to them outweigh the cost. So if it's going to keep the, con them connected to their friends, because friends are a huge agent of socialization at a certain age, in addition to family, school, right, friends. Uh, so if they are 
isolated inside so much and they're just itching to get out, they're probably going to make decisions they wouldn't have made before. Um, or the group that they're hanging around with, it, it does matter. Parents, I know it's hard, but it, it does matter. And they're going to influence each other so much. So we just have to monitor. I think it always goes back to cause it always goes back to having honest conversations with your kids. And if you can establish that trust that you're there and you're going to talk with them honestly and guide them, it goes back to what Brandy says too. talk with your kids. Like we're talking about suicide at the beginning here. Talk about it. We need to talk about it more. That's absolutely right. Kevin Hines is that guy who was going to jump. Well, he did. He jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge and he survived. And he said he regretted it right when he jumped. And he said, I wish somebody had just looked at me and asked me how I was doing when I was taking the bus ride there or when I was standing there and nobody asked him, how you doing? Nobody made eye contact with him. And that kind of stuff is important. So these kids, if they feel like they're seen, if they feel like they're valued, if there's open dialogue that's honest among parents and parents understand how to speak with their kids to reach them, I think they're going to be okay. Now, are kids going to mess up? Yep. And Brandy had it. Talk with your kids. Let them know you're going to be loved regardless, but you're going to walk through life with them and guide them. And that starts early. That's why we have to educate people early about that because then by the time they're teenagers doing this kind of thing, uh, they're not. it's not like they're never going to screw up because they will. They'll mess up, but we can then guide them and they'll know that they're loved and they'll do less of this. That's the hope. And I like how you said age appropriate conversations, but it's an evolution. I see a lot of parents that talk to their four and five and six year olds as though they're two year olds. So when you say age appropriate, let's, you know, there comes a time where you stop the baby talk and you stop talking about yourself in the third person. That's just a little pet peeve of mine. So <laughs> we, uh, that conversation also needs to grow and develop. So if you want your children to grow up and be adults, start talking to your children as adults and, and move them through that process of, of maturity as well. Yes. I, I was going through your podcast and you talked in one of your recent podcasts about celebrities and we have a lot of celebrities and role models because of social media, right? I mean, somebody can be famous for nothing right now just because they have a million followers. So there's right. that kind of celebrity. And then you have the movie stars. And what's difficult is you see now you have celebrities ponying up to pay bail for protesters. I mean, it talk about the perfect storm. Just got another layer of cloud coverage. Yeah. How do we help our children or, or can we even help our children pick heroes, mentors and celebrities that are good for them? Oh, gosh, that's so hard. It's so hard because... You can try, you can try to influence them. Um, it depends on how much control you want over them, to be honest. And I know lots of different people who have controlled lots of different aspects of their kids' lives. And that's, that's just based on your belief system. That's based on your value system. And so mine may not match yours or the next person. But I do have to say, you do need to watch your kid, like get to know your kid. So my 16 year old, for example, I mean, he, he watches videos that are ridiculous and they're, they're terrible. They're terrible role models. But I actually look at what he's doing in his life. And is he emulating that? No. Um, is he treating other people rudely because of that? No, he's not. He's actually a pretty nice kid. Um, does he do silly things? Yeah. But is he doing that? No. So He's not impressionable to the point where he's going to copy those things. And he, so because I have open dialogue with him, I know what he's thinking. I know what his strategies are in life. I feel like he's going to be okay. Now, if my other kid was doing that um, and he was had bad behaviors, well, I'll tell you, um, my nine-year-old was watching, he loves Mario. So he watched YouTube videos of just, you know, mindless Mario games to him. He loved it. But there was this older guy who was using bad language and stuff. And I caught on, I'm like, and it, Maybe not the bad language you and I think about, but it was inappropriate. You know what I mean? It wasn't great. And then his, he started copying some of it. And we're like, oh, no, we're shutting that right down. So at that point, I had to take control and just remove that altogether. So it depends on the kid and your relationship with them. So to your point, we really do need to know our children and don't show up when they're 12 and 13 and 14. That started when they were 
when they were in the womb and you were talking to them, right? Yes. It's, it's and, good communication throughout that process. Yeah. So that it's not new communication. It's this yeah. is the way dads always talk to me. My kids are that way now. As I mentioned, they're 26 and 22. And and every once in a while, I know I get their eyes rolling because, oh, it, and this is when you know something works. So, so my son was here yesterday and we were actually cleaning up some things and and he kind of rolled his eyes and he said, well, to quote you, dad, oh, gosh. and he and verbatim shared like the moral of a story that I told him when he was a little kid. And I thought, awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Because yeah. even when you don't think they're listening, oh, they're listening. Yes. And everything is a teaching moment. So if we're always having the dialogue, and and we said it in a little bit of jest, right? But he remembered it word for word, the moral of the story, which then allowed us to even talk about it further. And we had a very nice adult conversation, 22-year-old with his dad, in a different way than when he first learned it when he was 12. Right. And that's why that oh, messaging wow. has to continue developmentally. Like you said, it has to evolve, but... It, the love, the security always has to be there. Even though you're going to mess up, you're going to mess up. And that's okay because then you can just, we always did like a, let's restart because I'm going to mess up too because I'm, a, I'm a, a human being. But they also have to make sure that you do the check-in later, right? Anyway, there's so much we could say about this, but it is really an important conversation. That goes back to the brain. They are conceptualizing the issue a little differently now and because they're growing, they're maturing, and that's what we want. Would you like to add anything here as we start in towards the home stretch? There's so many things we could talk about. Do you want to, I'll just give you a, kind of a couple of things if you want to run with any of them. As far as bullying, social media, gaming, anything that you want to add there before we just take a look at some of the resources that might be available? Yeah, so I say that if if your kids are starting to get at the age where they're asking for social media, and they're asking for gaming, um, you have to ease them into it and be their lifeline and monitor it. And then when they seem like they're managing their lives a little bit more, you can give them a little bit more choice and freedom. That's how life goes. That's how society goes. So we're going to walk you through it. We're going to make sure you're doing okay. How are your behaviors? Is there a change in your behaviors? That's a big thing with bullying. Um, we look for our kids' behaviors to change. If they were withdrawn, or sorry, if they were involved in things before and they become withdrawn, why? There's a reason. That doesn't just happen. There's always a reason. So paying attention to your kid, knowing your kid always is always my advice. But looking for those behavior shifts. And if they've been online for a, a long time or, or something's changing as a result of them being online, even if it's over a couple of months or weeks or days, Ask them what's going on. They probably won't be honest. Um, they're, <laughs> right? <laughs> if you know them, though, you can pick up on those cues. And that's why I think trauma-informed parenting and education is important so we can really find it and then pre press on. Don't ignore it. This whole parenting thing, nobody ever prepares us for. It's right? so you, you gotta You got to go to a class. You got to go take a test to get a driver's license. You have to get a marriage license, but... Yeah. Where in the world, un unless Amazon Prime forgot to send it to me <laughs> 26 years ago, I never got the owner's manual. When my daughter came, there was no owner's manual. There wasn't even an Ikea picture of how it was all <laughs> to get put together. That's how it feels, though, as a parent, that Ikea furniture. What the hell the heck am I going to do with this? How do I always <laughs> end up with two extra screws? <laughs> they told me there were two extras. I'm trying to figure out where to put them. Right. Yes. And then with our kids, well, I, I got extra pieces and we hope all those pieces, uh, you know, fit together and they grow up to be happy, healthy, self-confident kids. You know, like Khalil yeah. Gibran talks about in The Prophet, they're, you know, they're not our kids, so to speak, but they're given to us for 18 years so that we can teach them confidence and competence and give them the roots of responsibility and the wings to fly. But at some point it's their life and we yeah. have to let go. Yeah. And they'll always be our kids, but that doesn't mean they're, you know, children. And that's the thing I've, 
I've really enjoyed is watching them grow into fully functioning independent people and now having people adult relationships with with my adult children. That's the payoff. Someday I'll have grandkids and then they tell me, that's awesome. <laughs> okay. That's probably not going to happen for a while. <laughs> well, you never know. You never well, know. You never know. <laughs> what other resources are available, Charlie, that we could look to to help us be better parents, help our children cope, and just understand how we can be better in this process? Well, we talked a lot about um, vulnerability and Brandy mentioned that as well. I, I think we need to look into Brene Brown's work. And I, I don't know if anyone, I know a lot of people listening probably know of Brene Brown, but she talks a lot about shame. And I think a lot of parents, and I don't know about you, Cause, but as a mother, it, it hurts so bad when we feel so guilty that we're going to mess up our kids. Like I think about that constantly. I, my choices are about how can I give my kid the best opportunity here? Sometimes as it might be a fault that I know as much as I do about the developing brain. It's so hard. Uh, but if we're constantly learning, that's good. So I think Brene Brown's work, we really need to look at that if you're feeling like you can't be vulnerable because you mentioned that earlier because we need to be vulnerable. The guy you mentioned who says he can't be vulnerable, yes, we need to be because we're human and we need to grow and learn. Um, I always mention Dan uh, Siegel's work too, the whole brain child. And if you're a parent, it's a great resource. It's not a perfect parenting manual. There is none. Your life is different than somebody else's. I think we need to be really cautious about how other people influence us. I had a lot of pressure externally to be the perfect mom and it crushed me. It crushed me and I'm in a much better place because of it, but it took a lot of work to get there. So Dan Siegel's works great. Uh, Vanderkoff works really good around trauma, understanding what that said so at this time. That's a really good resource too. Yeah. Lots of important people out there to listen to. And there's more information than ever before. We just have to have the courage to your point, be vulnerable and then reach out because there is yeah. so much information, so much information, but we have to take the personal responsibility that if it's to be, it's up to me. If it's to be, I've, I've got to be the one to embrace this development process to be the best parent that I can be and to have faith that we are all going through something that is completely unknown. You can't read a book to go through what we're going through right now. That's going to no. describe, Oh, so if you go through a pandemic, add just an extra little bit of vinegar. And if you're going through civil unrest, add just a little more sugar, right? There's no recipe for this. We're all, I mean, mm -hmm. talk about the Braille method. We're all just feeling in the dark as far as how to, how to cope ourselves and then lead those who are following us in our homes. Yep. And it's, if you can always think of self, not selfish, but self, like take care of yourself so you can show up to others better, self and others. And we don't have control of this pandemic. We don't have control of when schools are going to open and how they're going to open. We don't have control personally of the riots, but what we do have control of is we can check in on other people. We can check on people, whether we love them or not, we can check in on them. And if, if you need to make a meal for someone that's going to help them out at that moment, that's something you can control and something you can do. Make people feel valued. It's huge. And look them in the eye. Let them know that you care. And yeah. I love you are some pretty strong words. Yeah. That we, but we should share more often. Not with just yeah. those that we, that we live with. That's a, it's an empowerful thing. It's a very powerful thing. For those that have tuned in later in the interview here, I teed it up by saying you're the host of Advancing Humanity podcast. Give us just a little bit more about that and tell us how to subscribe. Wow. Okay. So Advancing Humanity came together after I decided as an educator that we needed to, I needed to learn more about mental health because I was teaching about it, but I didn't understand it from the clinical perspective. So I decided to go get my master of social work so I could marry the two together. And the podcast just naturally came out of that. My 16 year old son, he said, mom, you've been talking about this for a while. Just get her done. Get it. So in March, I launched it. We've got 40 episodes, uh, 38 are out couple got lots more all the time. I'm always interviewing people. And the idea is to share ways that we can all move forward together as humanity, um, as to be, to thrive. That's really the idea through health, 
uh, innovation, connection. It always comes back to connection and health encompasses physical and mental health and innovation. Like how are we gonna get better? All of this that's happening in the world today, we have a lot of conversations about that because we're in it right now. So we're anywhere that you can listen to a podcast, we're there. Just search up Advancing Humanity, choose the episodes that speak to you. If you can leave an honest comment, that's really helpful to me because then it gives me feedback. And if you can connect with me personally, That'd be awesome because then you can tell me what's working. What do you want to hear? Who do you want me to reach out to to do the show? Because we're all in this together. I, I want to just reach the masses for that reason. Sounds like we're on a similar mission. And that's why so. we're here together is hopefully good people helping good people get the message out to make a difference in the lives of millions. And with technology today, that's what we're trying to do. So, Charlie, this is our first experience together. I certainly hope it's not the last. Right. Absolutely. I definitely will keep in touch with you because we need to do this and we'll do it together. Awesome. All the best as you continue to make a difference. And I love how it says on your website, you're helping the thriving human experience grow. So thank you for what you're doing and you stay your course. You too are a, a, a lighthouse on the shores during a perfect storm and everyone needs your light as well. And for our viewers and listeners today, I leave you with our almost our mantra now, and that is keep shining brightly because someone out there needs to be guided by your light. Have a great day, and thanks for being here. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.